There we go. Okay, well, good evening, everyone. This is Mel here from Sneakers Corner, and we have a new guest who's called Peace in Jesus, and uh, he's going to be talking to us about other contradictions in the Quran, particularly in relation to the, the concept of the Messiah or al Messi. Um, Peace in Jesus, do you want to maybe introduce yourself to our audience? Sure. Well, thanks for um, inviting me, Mel. It's really an honor to come and join your uh, show here. Um, well, I, I've been interested in uh, theology for quite a number of years, really. And uh, in particular, I've been interested in following your videos. I find them very interesting. And I think uh, within the next uh, year or so, I think <laughs> you're going to come to some very interesting conclusions. I uh, noted the Chinese one, actually, which you lost it. Uh, if you can actually find the missing link, um, as you seem to be heading towards, uh, to join the Kuriana to the Quran, I think that will be very interesting. Well, I just wanted to talk about um, what I would call theological contradictions in the Quran. Um, they're not so much contradictions in terms of the text within the text, but they're more about a contradiction in terms of the concept of the Messiah. And as you probably realize, I'm sure your viewers do, um, the Messiah is essentially a Jewish concept and uh, it became a Christian understanding. And there's been a lot of development from all the time through the scriptures, from Moses right up to Jesus himself. So we really need to follow that through to be able to understand the background to the Messiah and what the Messiah is, what his purpose is, what his qualifications are, and um, what it's all about, basically. So um, without further ado, I'll go on to my first slide to start that. Okay. I'll just bring myself down here to get myself out of the way. Okay, so I've called this the Quran's Messiah contradiction. So the Quran mentions Isa, otherwise known as Jesus, as the Messiah, 11 times as Al-Masih, I think. Uh, so this has to be quite an important designation in the Quran considering more times than Muhammad's mentioned. So as you probably are all well aware, um, Muhammad's mentioned about four times, and five if we include Ahmed. I've got the references there just underneath for you to see, but I'm sure you're probably quite familiar with those. So uh, along with the characters and stories of the Quran, which have been adopted by the author of the Quran, um, the Christian uh, and Jewish sources of, of these characters um, really need to be defined in terms of their original uh, location, which is in the Bible. So we need to look at a reference, a real meaning for the Jewish Messiah. But what we find in Islam is, in the Quran in particular, is that it's lost its contextual meaning. So although we talk about the Messiah in Christian and Jewish terms, once we come over to Islam, something's gone a bit wrong. So um, I'm going to give some examples of some things which you'll get as replies if you ask uh, some Muslims about who the Messiah is. Uh, you might see some quite strange answers. Here's one. Isa, the son of Maryam, is called al Masi because he did not touch any sick or disabled person except that they were cured by Allah's permission. Some of the Salaf also said that he was called al Masi due to his contact with the earth and his frequent traveling therein, or the propagation of the earth of the religion. According to these two sayings, al Masih means one who touches. Um, we also find that uh, he's thought of as having flat feet. Um, quite a strange concept, really. But where that came from, I have no idea. But some, some of the, the beliefs are that because he traveled from one country to another, well, did he? I don't know, but he certainly traveled and walked a lot. But, um, you know, here we have again, it's also said that he is al because his feet were flat with no hollow to the soles of his feet. And it was said that he was touched with blessings or that he was purified from sins and was therefore blessed. In these cases, al would mean one who is touched. But the first meaning is the most apparent and Allah knows best. In any case, there is no connection between this belief or action 
and the benefit of knowing it is minimal. And that's very concerning. See, right there, the, the understanding of the Messiah is apparently minimal in Islam. It's that's strange. Funny. It's strange. And, and the question is, is it because they don't know or because they don't want to know or because they'd rather not know? Because perhaps they, what they could know about the Messiah in, in terms of the G Jewish idea or the Christian idea might be undermining the narrative that they want to present. And they obviously want to downplay the role of Jesus in order to enhance their Arabic prophet. I'm absolutely sure that's, that's correct. But, but if you follow your uh, research, Mel, where you're going with um, how the process went from uh, apparently anti-Trinitarian Christians all the way through to uh, the, the Islamic religion, well, it could just be that it's in some way lost. Some of its meaning has been lost by in the process, as well as a little bit of, let's say, changing the stories. Yeah, yeah. Anyway. I'd say I, I, I like that explanation, actually, because it's, it's a more natural explanation. It's not, it doesn't require a conspiracy, but it just... Yeah. natural process of their theology as it kind of yes. takes an anti-trinitarian route yeah yes absolutely so um let's go on to the next slide so often when you talk about the messiah with muslims um you'll you'll get some um, this quotation from matthew 15 24 um jesus said i was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of israel so you see in this graphic below, um, Jesus is um, demoted to being basically a shepherd of Israel. Uh, there isn't any global purpose to the Messiah. He's somebody who's demoted and almost um, put into a low position, I would say. And, and uh, they will also say that um, it's to do with rubbing or smearing of oil, which is correct. They'll use the uh, Hebrew term for smearing, which is related to the word Mashiach. Um, but other than that, if you start to explore, I think you'll get quite, quite, some quite blank expressions. Let's go on to the next slide here. So what is his Jewish purpose? So I've chosen a few topics here to redeem, be the redeemer of Israel and the world, to establish the throne of Israel as king, to gather the dispersed Jews to Israel, to judge the nations and to rule them, and to bring the messianic age, is what in Jewish terminology, the messianic age is when there'll be peace and harmony all over the world. And they tend to quote the, uh, the scriptures which talk about the wolf lying down with the lamb and uh, no more war, so swords will be turned into plowshares, etc. So, so that's the, just going to say, that's quite a contrast from the meanings in Islam towards the idea of the Messiah. You know, there's, there's no references to, to being flat footed, for example, or walking from place to place. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, uh, no. But, but absolutely, you're right, Mel, because I mean, if you look at the last item on this, yeah, this is talking, see, from a Jewish perspective, they don't just believe it's the Messiah is somebody to bring peace to Israel. They, they, their full understanding is it will bring peace to the entire globe, the entire nations. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it's just so massive. It's it bears no relationship at all to what you see in Islam in terms of who the Messiah is. Yeah, yeah. So let's go on to the next slide. So here's his Christian purpose. Well, again, I've chosen topics. I mean, you might think of other things. So I've said to redeem all mankind who believe in him as the divine resurrected Messiah and the great high priest for all who turn to him in repentance. To redeem every individual who gives his life to him, to follow him, in which he will guide them and reveal his will to them. And to reveal the spiritual kingdom of God prior to its eventual physical establishment with him as the king ruling the nations. And to bring justice in his future coming as the son of man. Yeah. So what about his Islamic purpose? Uh, well, I put a couple of links at the bottom, actually, of this slide, which uh, anybody is welcome to um, look up, because actually you'll see that they've made quite an effort to explain their concept of who the Messiah is and what he does, what his position is. Um, and there's quite a lot they put there, to be fair. But um, It's very confused. 
it's very confused, yes. <laughs> it, it is odd. Um, where they've got that from, I don't know. That. But I want to bring in an essential principle of Hebrew scripture here. Uh, so I know this is a lot of text, so I don't expect you to read it. But I just want to say that um, when we're looking at um, things from uh, Jewish and Christian tradition, we need to look deep into the Jewish scriptures. And that's where the Messiah is firmly based, right from Moses, right until Jesus. And you'll see in a minute, shortly how I mentioned about Jesus, for, his, for example, on the road to Emmaus, when he looked back and he's told, he told the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, don't you know that the Son of Man should have suffered all these things? And, and he, he speaks of the Messiah from Moses right up to his own time. So I'm saying here, um, so the revelation on the covenants came by way of prophets who received prophecies containing the word of Yahweh. So by extension, if you mention any biblical characters in any other book, like for instance, as you see in the Quran, it has to me find its meaning in the Jewish scriptures itself. It finds its qualifications in it. So by extension, where any of the biblical characters are referred to in any writing outside of the canon of Jewish scripture, these same principles should be applicable to such writings because the characters themselves are only legitimized in scripture by the revealed authority of Yahweh. So it's the prophecies in the Jewish scripture themselves which define the purpose, the qualifications, the meaning, and the extent of the Messiah. But I want to also say that here, uh, if you look further down, such prophecies are legitimized. Such revelation may be concealed, but it must be present. In the case of Messiah Yeshua, that is Jesus, the covert presence of revelation of the Messiah means that this could almost only be seen retrospectively. So that's when we look back on Hebrew history and we look back into the text. So if you see the graphic at the bottom, you see that to, in order for people to look and see the Messiah, they have to look back into the scriptures, to the going towards the left, and go back into history to see where it all started, which is one of the things Jesus explained later. So let's go on to the next slide. So Jesus states this principle quite clearly. In Matthew 5.17, which is actually a very famous, uh, a, a favorite scripture quoted by Muslims, but for a different reason. Uh, Jesus says, uh, do not think that I come to abolish the law of the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Um, he came to fulfill the Torah and the prophets. The word law in the Greek is nomos. But actually in the original Aramaic, which Jesus would have spoken this verse in, he would have said Torah, uh, because it's clearly wrong to say he came to fulfill just the law because the whole Torah he came to fulfill. And so anybody big, saying that... It's, it's bigger than the law, yeah. Yeah, anybody saying that wouldn't actually be accepted as being the Messiah because that would be saying, well, I don't accept all the rest of the Torah. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's just a, one of those things about translation. Yeah. So he came in full fulfillment of the Torah and the prophets. And this is exactly what I'm saying here, that uh, it's the Torah and the prophets that he had to fulfill. So those things which are the qualifications and the roles and the description of the Messiah, those are the things which he had to uh, fulfill. So it's not simply affirming the law of Moses, as Islam claims often. So in Jesus' mind, and I think this is a really important point, um, to understand the Messiah is to understand Jesus' mind. It doesn't matter what I think, it doesn't matter what anybody thinks, it matters what Jesus thinks because he was the Messiah and is the Messiah. So to understand who the Messiah is, we need to get inside his mind almost. Now that's quite a task, but, but you can do that to a limited extent by searching through what he says. Um, and also, because uh, you'll see how, how he looks into the prophecies and he understands the prophecies that he actually himself is fulfilling them. And the first century Jews are also doing that. They search the scriptures to understand the Messiah. Well, who was he? Um, so in Matthew 2, 4 to 6, uh, they said, oh, he's in, he's in Bethlehem of Judea, for it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, 
are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. I don't know if that's, you're following what I'm saying here, but it's, I'm basically saying that the scriptures contain all the information we need to know, but we need to look at it from a backwards point of view, retrospectively, to understand it. Yeah, I think a couple, of, a couple of years ago when I read through the Old Testament all the way through, it was pretty obvious, even though all of the different books were very different genres, that there was one common element, this forward-looking to the Messiah. Um, and even all those theophanies were all little hints along the way. So if you disregard that and you try and understand what the Messiah is just with the Quran, you have no hope of understanding. You have got to go back to the Old Testament. You've got to go back to the New Testament to really understand it. You yeah, have, absolutely. And I just, this, you know, the, the thing here is as well, you know, that Muslims actually say, well, the, the Injil was lost. Well, of course, right in Matthew 5, 17, Jesus is saying what the Injil was. It's the Torah and the prophets. Okay. Let's go on to the next slide. Then. Yeah, so so essentially, yeah, if you have the Torah and the prophets, you can't just dismiss it and say, well, no, it was lost, because then you're saying, you're literally throwing away everything then. Yeah, that, that was his angel, literally. Um, yeah. That was his gospel, it was the Torah and the prophets. If you had brought anything else, he actually wouldn't have been accepted, because everything, as far, from a Jewish perspective and Jewish mind, everything that's... Um, in the previous scriptures is sacrosanct. Yeah. You can't yeah. just dismiss it and bring something else. Yeah. 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 So uh, in, in these graphics here, I've got a couple, a top and a bottom graphic. And uh, I don't want to insult anybody's intelligence. Please don't think I'm, I am. I, I'm simply wanting to clarify something which is very simple and you will all probably know it, but it helps just to put it across. Yeah. So um, there's a time line going towards the right in which things are revealed by progressive revelation yeah. through history, through prophecies, uh, through events. And you see on the right-hand side, Jesus is the sort of culmination of that. Yeah. But if you look on the graphic beneath, you see that we can only, Jesus, even Jesus himself was reading from the scriptures, as you can see here in Luke 4, 21, and he began to say, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. So Jesus was reading back into the Torah and the prophets and into the history all the way to Moses and seeing himself written in it. That's so important to, to bear in mind. So I call it this uh, retrospective understanding yep. uh, going to the left. So uh, let's go to the next slide. So we find this in scripture itself, Isaiah 53, 1. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Now, here the arm of the Lord is concealed in Scripture, but is ready to be revealed to all when the Son of Man returns as the Messiah. What this means, I believe, is that Isaiah 53 is a future declaration by a representative of Israel upon understanding the revelation of the Messiah, which they didn't understand 2,000 years ago. This revelation looks back retrospectively upon Yeshua, the crucified one, as the Messiah that Israel did not recognize. So again, it's all about this not recognizing the scriptures. So you see on the road to Emmaus, uh, Jesus speaks to the two disciples who were wandering away, feeling forlorn because they'd seen their leader and master crucified. He says, oh, foolish ones, and so of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So there's an example of that. And I want to point out too that um, Jesus actually did refer to uh, Isaiah 53, though in, in, in almost um, covert terms. In Mark 9, 12, Jesus made an allusion to Isaiah 53. He said, um, how, is, how is it that um, Elijah does come first to restore all things? How is it written of the Son of Man that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt when you've only got to uh, 
take a look at Isaiah 53, you'll see that he was despised and rejected and so on. Yeah. Um, so, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. Isaiah 53, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Psalm 22, 16, for dogs can pass me. The company of evildoers encircles me. They pierce my hands and feet. Pretty graphic stuff. What I think is interesting is the fact that Muslims often mock the idea that God could be crucified and or that God could die, you know, in their simplistic way. But what they're forgetting, as you've really made clear, is the point of it all, that it is a fulfillment of the prophecies and they're ignoring the Old Testament um, and they're um, denying the Old Testament by saying it's all been corrupted, you know, which is really ridiculous because we have you know, the Dead Sea Scrolls, and we have got plenty of the Old Testament in those to prove that the Bible we have today is pretty much verbatim what we had. And any differences are very minor indeed. The core of the prophecies are, are there for anyone to yeah. see, you know, so. Yeah. Mm. And, and they're, they're, it's fed actually by a lot of misinformation uh, circulating in Muslim circles, unfortunately. Um, I and I would to go into that, but. yeah, I would just say to any Muslims that are watching, is do your own research. Don't listen to the Taoists. Go and do your own research. Go and pick up a Bible and read it for yourself and make up your own mind. You know, if you don't trust us, get yourself a Bible and look and read, and see what you make of it yourself. You know. Yeah, honestly, um, all I'm saying here is what I believe to be the truth. And, and uh, my, my purpose is really just to say, what, you know, when I see something which isn't correct, just to say, you know, that's not correct, and I want to point it out to people. Uh, so I've nothing against anybody. This is just about saying what I believe to be the truth. Yep. So I want to take um, Isaiah 42.6 here, which is very properly at the moment being propagated as a scripture um, about Muhammad. And... And some people, unfortunately, are being persuaded that it is about Muhammad, <laughs> uh, for, for very silly reasons, really. Um, if we take Isaiah 42, verse 6, um, <clears throat> in the Hebrew, it starts with, I am Yahweh. So, I am Yahweh, the Lord. In most English Bibles, it just says the Lord, but actually in the Hebrew, it says, it says Yahweh, yud heh vav I've called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations. Now, <clears throat> if we dissect this a little bit, first it says uh, the person being spoken of in this passage is called by Yahweh. But of course, Muhammad was not called by Yahweh. He, he believes he was called by Allah. Good point. Secondly, yeah. secondly um, he's called in righteousness. Well, um, again, he, we have to look at the context of the scriptures because this scripture was written for Jewish people. It was written to Jewish people. And uh, righteousness in terms of the Jewish context means somebody who was following the laws of Moses, somebody who was obedient to the laws of Moses. And you might even, in Jewish terms, you might even say he was a Zadik somebody was a holy righteous person in terms of following the laws of Moses. They cannot possibly refer to somebody who's illiterate who can't even read the laws of Moses, let alone follow them. Excellent point, yes. <laughs> yeah. So, and then see, he was given as a covenant to Israel. There was no way Muhammad was given as a covenant to Israel. Not in any sense. If you can find one, please let me know, but I, I don't know of one. And then uh, the last one, he's given as a light to the nations. Well, actually light, in terms of the scriptures, if we look in John 1, 4, we see what light actually means. When John, uh, Jesus, is, is, his light is described as, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. This life is eternal light. Like, this light is eternal light. So it's basically the light is 
eternal life. It's 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 a, almost a synonym. Synonym. So the, it's referring to eternal life. So essentially, it's got a salvif, salvific meaning. Yeah. Yeah. And yes, yes in the standard Islamic narrative. Muhammad couldn't even be sure of his own salvation. So no. I don't see how that would work. No, absolutely not. But, but also, sadly, that's, that's an example of, of how um, Muslims are being led astray. And so I, I just, you know, I, it makes me really sad, actually. I, I just want people to know this is what the truth. And, yeah. and again, for people who are Christians, who are being told these things, I, I just, why do you believe that? You know, it's, this is clearly what what the scripture is saying and uh, it disqualifies Muhammad completely. Yeah, I would also say, you know, for anyone who's been confronted with this argument, look at what it says before 42, once 42, six, and look what it says afterwards. Read it in context. Don't accept it isolated from the rest of the passage, because it's pretty obvious what it's about. You know, and Muhammad definitely doesn't fit in the context there. Definitely doesn't. And you see, one of the arguments that, that is brought up is that uh, Muhammad went to all these different places into the deserts of, of uh, uh, various places near Salah and etc. into the wilderness, Paran. And, but that's not actually what the text is saying. It's saying that it's, it, it's saying the message, the gospel message, went to those places and people rejoiced and sang. It's yeah. not saying at all that somebody took a, a journey there. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. That's what, you know. Yeah. Okay, let's go on to the next one then. Uh, so what is the promised Messiah? He is the uniquely appointed and anointed one, distinct from all other people, referred to in Hebrew tradition as Mashiach. So he's the promised Messiah known as the son of David, prophesied to come through the seed of David by the prophet Nathan in 2 Samuel 7, 12 to 16, and spoken of in Psalm 2 quite clearly. There are other places, but those are two of the main ones. So he will establish his throne over Israel and rule the nations. He's eternal. You can even see um, excerpts from the Talmud, which speak about this, which I was quite surprised. But anyway, he's, uh, all authority is given to him. He will destroy the works of Satan. And he is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. We find that in Revelation 13, 8 and a few other verses. So those are some of the expectations. Since Jesus pointed to prophecies about himself, I want to ask which, which are some of the important ones? There are lots, but which are the important ones to consider? So Isaiah 53, the suffering servant, sometimes known as Mashiach ben Yosef. Psalm 22, the pierced one. So, uh, Isaiah 61, verse 1, the spirit of the Lord is, is, a, is anointed me. Isaiah 42, 67, the one given as a covenant. And uh, you see Daniel uh, 9, 24, 26, Messiah is cut off prior to temple destruction. So those are some of the important ones. So now I want to pose a question here. I'm calling this the Messiah, Quran's Messiah contradiction. So the Quran contains statements which theologically contradict each other. So for the average Muslim, he'll look at the text of the Quran and think, well, no, there's no contradiction here. But the contradiction is in the wider issue of messianic theology. Where does the Messiah come from? Is he actually um, totally alienated from Judaism and Christianity? No, he's not. That's where it all comes from. So example one, there are two statements here. Um, they come from, I think, 4171 so on so jesus is the messiah statement a statement b jesus is no more than a prophet or a messenger so i want to say really if a is true then b is false if b is true then a is false a and b cannot both be true at the same time let's have a look why So I've probably got a bit to excess here on the text, but um, we need to look at the defining characteristics of the Messiah and what qualifies him to be, as you see at the bottom here, so Messiah's qualifications by prophetic fulfillment, Messiah's role and purpose. So 
if you look at this slide, uh, on the left-hand side, we see two headings, scriptural qualifications, and underneath that, role and purpose. And on the right-hand side, I've listed some of the things which I thought of. So, um, so on the left-hand side, is Jesus no more than a messenger, according to the list of items on the right? So we look at the list of items on the right. He's anointed, righteous, from eternity. His unique promise, son of David. He's rejected by man. He's crucified. He's the son of God. He sees God and declares the word. He's a prophet, being good news and the gospel. He's a redeemer. He's a king of Israel and he rules the nations. Sounds like a lot more than being just a mere prophet to me. <laughs> Am I, I missing so. something? <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> I think you're I think you're quite right. So role and purpose is Jesus no more than a messenger, according to the list of items on the right. No, definitely not. So a rule of the nations, eternal, son of God, etc. So I think we covered that. It's surprising, no, I, I was obviously being um, sort of a bit sarcastic there, but it's surprising that Muslims don't see that. That it's clear it's clear that Jesus is an awful lot more than just merely a prophet. And and like the prophet's role was really to point to him in the first place, you know? So if he's the fulfillment of all of these prophecies, then he has to be much more than a prophet just by that fact alone. Yes, I, I think it has to be a willing choice to say, well, I believe in the Quran, so anything outside of it or anything that disagrees with it, I don't believe in it. Yeah. That's all I can think, really. But I, I, would, I would have thought that intelligently to look um, ex, in, in a sort of explorative manner to what are the foundations of of our of your faith you would look dig deeper you would look into where does it all come from yeah and the Quran so, you know challenges people to to go back to the scriptures to confirm that what they're saying is true you know so that challenge is there so yeah. you can't have it both ways really yeah yeah that's true so the second example is uh, a Jesus is the Messiah and B, Jesus was not crucified. Well, again, if A is true, then B is false. If B is true, then A is false. A and B cannot both be true at the same time. But why? You see, I've, I've asked Muslims that, and they've said, no, that doesn't make any sense of that at all. It doesn't make any sense to me. Of course, they can both be true. Uh, but actually, again, we have to look back into the where, where the the Messiah is defined, what are his role and qualifications? See, what is certain is that Jesus himself understood his own coming execution as the will of God, his Father, as written in Isaiah 53, for the redemption of money. Jesus knew that to be the redeeming Messiah, he must be crucified. Anybody reading the Gospels will have seen umpteen times Jesus saying to his disciples, um, I'm going to go into Jerusalem, I'm going to be crucified, as a son of man, I, I go to die and you'll all desert me. Things like that. Even, he even rebuked Peter, didn't he? Uh, you know, for saying, well, oh, that can't be so, Lord. I'm, I'll die with you, as, you know. But uh, Jesus turned around and said um, that he was speaking out of Satan's mouth. <laughs> so, uh, you know, clearly Jesus understood his own destiny on this earth being one of crucifixion. So I'm saying here, if Jesus was not crucified, he can't be the Messiah. Because the Messiah has to fulfill what was written of him. So he has to suffer. He has to redeem the people. And the, the prefigurement of that was the sacrifice of the lambs in the temple. Yes. And, and Jesus has to be something on, the, on that level, some form of sacrifice through his death by the blood, by his own blood. And John the Baptist refers to him as the Lamb of God for that particular reason. Again, yes. pointing to the role of the Messiah as the Lamb that's slain uh, for the redemption of, of many. Yes. As, as you know, Mel, a con common objection by Muslims, it would be along the lines of, well, it's not fair for, you know, why would God sacrifice his son? And it's not fair uh, for one man to die for others. But they completely ignoring the Jewish context. I mean, anybody looking into the Jewish Hebrew context would realize that the whole story of Israel was one of covenants. Yeah. 
and, and so the covenants were always made in relation to blood yeah and there's so a, if you, and there's a quid pro quo there's a the contractual uh giving and taking and and part of that would be for the messiah to die in order yeah. to get that redemption now, if you leave that one side of it out the other side is not there either yeah you know so that's the that's the key yeah plus there's the, also the other issue that okay they say well it's not fair for jesus to die but they're quite happy for some innocent bystander to be crucified <laughs> yeah. on, on on his behalf so that doesn't make logical sense either but no, that's it doesn't that's avoiding accepting the idea that jesus just happened to be cru crucified yes yeah, the whole air, area of the crucifixion 204157 is total confusion it, yeah. it says everything that didn't happen it tells us nothing what did happen yeah <laughs> in yes. fact um I, I counted up, I, I broke that uh, verse down into um, parts, and I found that there are 11 words or phrases of denial, and there are two uh, saying what supposedly happened. Right. So it's all about what didn't happen. It doesn't tell us any detail at all about what did happen, according to our level. Yeah, that's interesting, you know, when someone is in denial rather than actually giving the positive truth on it. And then there's, you know, there's, I suppose there's a whole other issue that actually maybe in the original aramaic the syriac from which the quran came from it was actually saying something completely different actually and that it got distorted conveniently in the direction that they wanted it to be distorted at a later stage you know yes absolutely uh, in fact i i i would argue that um surah 4157 is actually a confirmation of the crucifixion and Islam itself is a confirmation of the crucifixion. Anyway, Jesus could only qualify to be the Messiah if he fulfilled the prophecies of the suffering servant. So a study of Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22, combined with the revelation that Jesus was a lamb slain from the foundation of the world, allows us to see that Jesus' earthly destiny was the cross. Otherwise, the above prophecies would never be fulfilled. And uh, probably familiar with Isaiah 55 and 11, which says, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. So meaning that God's prophetic declarations, including the suffering servant, were destined to be fulfilled by the Messiah. Conversely, if Jesus did not fulfill Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22, which both betray the suffering redeeming servant, then he would be disqualified from being the Messiah. Hence his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane to conform his will to the Father's will. Uh, but you see, Jesus understood in the Garden of Gethsemane that he was to be crucified even though he hadn't been sentenced. At that point, there was no sentence of crucifixion. But Jesus knew he was going to be crucified. Why? Because of the prophecies. And you see, what he prayed there was his will to conform to the father's will and here we see it in isaiah 53 yet it was the will of the lord to crush him and actually i would point out to muslims who are confused by that in case they think that how can god have two divine wills in conflict with each other we're talking about the human will of christ that must conform his divine will would be in perfect conformity but on the human level he has to Assent, he has to give a human assent to that uh, divine will. Absolutely. Oh, so actually, the crucifixion and the resurrection are both foretold in Isaiah 53. You have to read it carefully to see it, but it's there. Um, but if he was not crucified, then Isaiah 53 would be false. And since we know that Jesus identified as Isaiah 53's suffering son of man for his rejection by Israel, uh, we would then end up in the situation where we are arguing not with people, but with Jesus. Because, again, it's, it's all about what did Jesus understand as the Messiah? What was his understanding? If we really want to know the truth, don't ask me, don't ask anybody else, but ask Jesus, well, what, what did you understand by you being the Messiah? We well, need to understand how he thought. There are many ironies about this subject. One being that although it's hard to demonstrate Islam would never have existed if Jesus had not been crucified. I think that probably will 
be something that will come up in your research somewhere, Mel. What, somehow what, or other. What do you mean in, in particular? Do you mean in the sense that it's Islam re requires there to be Christian churches for it to evolve into Islam, the anti-Trinitarian yes. reaction? Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 a raw, it's a trail, isn't it? It's yeah. a trail going all the way back to your anti-Trinitarian um, sects. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so another is that Surah 4157 is inadvertently a confirmation, I believe, that Jesus was certainly believed to have been crucified in, at that time. So rather than it being uh, something negative, in fact, it actually is a positive from my point of view. So actually, by denying that Jesus was crucified, surely that's saying that in the gospel at that time, it was claiming that Jesus was crucified. If, that, if, if the Gospels didn't have any reference to Jesus being crucified, at, say in the seventh century, as they, as they claim, because they say it got corrupted, mm. it makes no sense to deny what was in the Gospels if it wasn't there in the first place, if, if it had already been corrupted. So you know what I'm trying to say? So let's say if, if in an earlier century before Islam, there was some reference to um, to something other than Jesus being crucified, and then later it got put in. It, it doesn't make any sense for the the Quran to deny it because surely they are dealing with the the Gospels as is, and the Quran is confirming the Gospels and the Torah. So th I think they're caught in a bind, you know, with that that whole denial of the crucifixion. They can't get out of it. I think. I don't know if that makes any sense, but yes, I, I'm not sure that I can un unra unravel that one actually. <laughs> um, but yes, I agree. In what, what I'm saying, or maybe I've put it a different way, if what I'm saying is you have to have something in the text in order to deny that it's yeah. true. That's Absolutely. essentially what I'm saying. Yeah. So yeah. if it's in the text, then there, there well, you kind of have to say, well, is is the text corrupted or not you know that's the the next question um it's it's uh i i'd say if you were to go down through all the the logic of that i think you you end up having to say well when was it corrupted then and then how come the quran is saying that that the gospel and the the old testament confirms the message of the quran you can't have it both ways either it is corrupted or it isn't corrupted and that's i think one of the inher inherent contradictions in the Quran. Yes, I mean, I, I've never read the Diatessaron. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, is, it, is that available? I don't even know. I haven't but, seen uh, it either myself, yeah. No, um, and, but I, I would assume that if it's a compilation or a harmony of the Gospels, then it would definitely include the crucifixion. Yeah. And so I, I can't see how that could possibly be omitted. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. Shall we go on? Yep. Uh, not, not far to go now. So uh, I just want to say something about what I call Dharma games, really. So we're familiar with uh, an Islamic strategy of musical chairs and move the goalpost convenience, really, uh, where Bible verses are true if they are proof of Islam, but they're corrupted if they are not proof of Islam. Um, this means that when presented with the contradictions such as the ones I've presented here in these slides, they will avoid and deny them. Um, but actually, if you get into discussion uh, with Muslims about the, the Messiah, and what, who the Messiah is, what does it mean in Islam, what's the Messiah for, what is, he, what is his purpose, what are his qualifications, um, they generally change the subject because I think basically uh, it's out of their comfort zone. Uh, because um, suddenly, um, I don't think Muslims are really taught about the Messiah. They're not really, you know, they're not really taught who the Messiah is, what the Messiah is for, or what the Messiah can mean to them personally. And all, all they're given is this um, other rendition from the Quran. So it, it's a little too convenient to um, say up front, well, I will only accept the the verses from the Bible that agrees with our case. You know, that's not the way you're meant to do exegesis. You're meant to 
take the entire Bible to, in, in its entirety. What was it saying in, in its entirety? You can't throw out this verse and that verse because it doesn't no. fit the, the theory or the idea. No. When I first um, came across Muslim uh, uh, some years ago, I was, I was amazed that they uh, brought up this scripture from, I think it was Jeremiah 8 or 3, 8, 3 or something like that. It's talking about the, um, the pen of the scribes or the lying scribes or something. As if to say that um, scribes in the bi writing the Bible script would say that the rest of the Bible was rubbish, or that it was made up of falsehood. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I couldn't believe that that was a silly argument to make because obviously, if that was the case, then that very verse could be falsehood. <laughs> so it, it just, you know, it's just nonsense, really. It's circular, yeah. So uh, I just want to conclude here. Uh, there's a, an irony in 4157 um, where messianic concepts are misappropriated and misapplied. And uh, there's a bit of a confusion and a mix up here, let's be honest. The transcendent Isa of the Quran, who was raised up to escape the cross, may be a modified concept derived from Gnostic ideas, which we find, for example, present in Valentinianism and Docetism, in which Jesus' human part suffers. But in some way, his divine part is separate and raised up to heaven and doesn't suffer crucifixion. Well, you can find a number of writings about this uh, in the Gnostic Gospels. Although in Islam, Isa was raised up bodily and is still alive after 2,000 years, I'm arguing that's a hint of immortality there, but it doesn't make sense. Yeah. We can surmise that this Islamic version of Jesus is a mixture of both the bodily resurrection of the New Testament and the divine separation of Gnosticism. As a result, what Sura 4157 points to is a new version of Christ's divinity uh, in, in order to transcend the suffering of the cross. Without the assumed divinity borrowed from Gnosticism, Isa would be unable to escape the cross and be raised up as per the Islamic version of the Messiah. And we should bear in mind that there was no resurrection of the dead at that time, according to Islam. Um, so Isa could not have been resurrected, despite the teaching of Isa being raised up, which is really a reference to the resurrection of Christ in the New Testament. Right, okay, that's interesting. Yeah. So uh, it's an irony, considering the Quran's rejection of Jesus being no more than a prophet in Surah 4, 171. So what I'm saying there is basically, in order for him to be raised up at all, it had to be a divine act and to be raised up to go to the place it had to be divine himself so they've sort of borrowed something of divinity from gnosticism which does believe he's divine but yet they've done away with the death and the resurrection and they've combined the bodily resurrection with it which is right. a very bit of a strange concept yeah yeah it's also important to forget lastly but the author of the Quran stated the order of events for Christ. And we find this in Surah 1933. So peace is on me the day I was born, the day that I die, and that day I shall be raised up to life. Now, so as we can see from this verse, the order is chronologically as follows. First, Isa is born, the day I was born. Second, Isa dies, the day that I die. And third, Isa is raised to life again. The day I shall be raised up to life again. Can we see a problem here? Absolutely. We see, we see straight away that this contradicts Surah 4157, which states that Isa was not crucified or killed, but was raised up before dying. Thus, the author of the Quran left his readers and followers in a state of confusion over what can only be a contradiction in the text. The result of this contradiction is that Muslim scholars have produced arguments to try and justify what is obviously error. So we can expect multiple explanations as to how this is the perfect word of Allah. But meanwhile, for ordinary mortals, like perhaps you and I, Mel, it's clearly a mistake. That's a good one, yeah. yeah. I, I would imagine that what's happened is with Surah 4157, the the original Aramaic meaning got distorted over time. The other one didn't change. And so they've kind of diverted from each other, leaving a contradiction. 
Now they're yeah. stuck with it. Now they're stuck with this contradiction. Yeah. Uh, because of, basically because of a crown that is changing over time. There's mm. errors are entering into it. If we were to go back to this early version, I'm not saying it would be error free, but we probably would see less of these contradictions than we do now. It's, it's just it's just a mess that's getting worse over time. Yes, and, and that has, an, a, has a ring of truth about it, doesn't it? You know, yeah, it, that verse actually has a ring of truth in it, whereas Surah 4157 is clearly a corruption of it. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, so the, uh, I put at the bottom a, a link there if anybody wants to look at uh, this. This is um, Sam Shamoon. He does quite a lot of uh, information about this sort of stuff. Yeah. So if anybody wants to see more about that. Yeah, I think I think what that last part you're saying really kind of illustrates the law of entropy, that things go from order to disorder over time. Um, and so, you know, Wherever you have human elements involved with anything, they'll add a dot, they'll change a dot, they'll add their confusion to the mix, and you know they'll add a little bit to a story. And then what happens is over time, given enough years, it just goes off on a completely different tangent and you can hardly recognize what the original is. But this is something that Islam denies. Islam thinks that the Quran was perfectly preserved, even though we've got 30 plus different Arabic Qurans. It says that their narrative is sure, it has never changed, um, and it is historical. And yet, when we delve into that, we find it's full of holes as well. So there's a parallel between the two things. But, uh... Yeah, well, well, uh, thanks, Mel. That's, that's all I've got to say on, on this uh, presentation. So uh, thanks for well, the opportunity. Well, thank you, uh, Peace and Jesus. This has been brilliant. There's lots of great material, and um, I'm sure our viewers would probably do well to take screenshots of your arguments if ever they're talking to a Muslim, because I think they'll be very useful. And I like the way you've, you've put it together there, particularly with references that people can go and and look further to, you know, to to assure themselves, you know, that it's all correct and so on. So, yeah. so. So thank you very much, uh, Peace and Jesus, for coming on the channel. Um, you're more than welcome if there, if you, if you ever want to come back, if you got other sort of angles on on any aspect of of this whole story, um, please 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 feel free. So this is your first time to do this, but you were telling me before we rec went recording that you've got a YouTube channel or, or starting one. Well, I'm st I'm just starting one. Yes, I've only got one video on it at the moment, okay. which is basically um, sorry, it's basically uh, just explaining about um, looking for peace in Jesus. Excellent. Uh, so, seeking God, looking for peace in Jesus, in finding the Messiah in the right direction. Yeah. Well, I think what, what what better message could you give in today's world? I think if there's one thing that so many of us are looking for is that peace that the world cannot give. Absolutely. Yeah, so thank you very much, uh, Peace and Jesus. And, uh, you know, if our viewers are interested in finding out more, pop over to Peace and Jesus uh, YouTube channel and uh, show them some love and uh, give them a few likes and subscri subscribe to them. There's only one video on there at the moment, but just want to mention, but actually I'm planning to do one on the crucifixion. Uh, Excellent. From an Islamic and a Christian point of view. Brilliant. All right. Thank you very much, Peace and Jesus. We'll see you all. Thank you very much, Mel. See you very Thank soon. You. Bye bye.